Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports, episode 493. And I'm going to be totally honest. This has been a... I have had so many problems in recording this episode. One of them just happened. I've been talking for about 30 minutes. My I wasn't recording the entire time. Like, it's been that kind of episode. And I this is now my... My fourth attempt at recording this episode, I tried to record it yesterday. It was 96 degrees outside, and I was like, well, 96 degrees at 3 o'clock. I'm sorry, not doing that. It's too hot in here. I'm just refusing to sit in a tin box and record a podcast at that hot of weather. So I'm like, okay, I'll do it at night. And uh, I have a light now on my camera, so I figure, hey, I'll do it. The shot looked great, by the way. It was awesome. It was There was like dark moonlight silhouettes behind me. And the camera was on me. I was all lit up. I look great. One of my favorite, actually, setups for recording I've ever done before. Kind of a fun note to take and do it later. But I actually got sick. I got food poisoning. It was horrible. Uh, I threw up during the podcast and was like, well, I'm just going to shelve this, go to bed, and try it again in the morning. Here we are the next morning. Uh, Again, I I talked for 30 minutes just now. Realized, hey, I'm not recording at all. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that one stung. That was the most painful one, honestly, because I thought finally, like, it's going well. It's awesome. Here we are now. I've got, like, I'm going to take a video of this real quick so you can see from my perspective. I'm recording with, like, literally my shower towel. Um, it's a very thin one. Hung in the things you that you used to block the sunlight. What are they called? The, the sunshades or whatever. And it's supposed to, uh, it, it's dispersing the light a little bit so it's not as harsh on me with the sun coming up. It's early in the morning. Um, I also apologize because this episode's later than I thought. I, I'm camping with my family deep in the woods, uh, way in the middle of Oregon at a lake. Internet is horrible here, and I have to drive an hour to get internet. And I had, uh, I'll tell a story in my other podcast about me hunting down basically the last 5G hotspot in the Northwest. They said, you can't order one online. There's only one in Hillsboro. You gotta go. I tracked it down. Um, so... I say all that to let you know that I, I, I'm tired, I'm irritated, I'm like doing the best I can, and I, uh, I've i had a lot of trial and error t- with this episode in particular. Sometimes they're harder than others, and this one has been um, kind of a, like at this point, I'm like, I just don't want to do this. I'm almost like, screw this episode, just get rid of it. But I want to talk about Kyler Murray and the stupid helmets and stuff, so here we are, let's dive in. Uh, episode 493. Thank you for listening to me rant. I have to get that off my chest because it's been the most frustrating series of events I've ever had trying to record a podcast. And like people will be quick to blame it on the truck. A lot of it's just trial and error. A lot of it is just me. Like I didn't hit record for 30 minutes. That's just me being stupid or I got sick like that. You can't control that. But it's weird. How sometimes they all pile up on one episode and you have some shows that go incredible first time. No thought. This episode has been one of those ones that, for whatever reason, uh, I've had lots and lots of difficulty. Now, let's jump in. The big news today is that the Arizona Cardinals have given their quarterback, Kyler Murray, a massive new contract. It's a five-year, $230.5 million extension. It's uh, got $160 million guaranteed. So now if you do the math, Kyler Murray is under contract with the Arizona Cardinals through the 2028 season. He will be 31 years old by then. Also, Kyler Murray is now the second highest paid quarterback by average yearly earnings. He's making on average $46.1 million a year. Now, look, I do not mind Arizona giving Kyler Murray a big contract. In fact, I'm happy for the guy like for him himself. I'm like, wow. He just got paid generational wealth. That's cool. That's exciting. Um, I think you could argue he's already made life-changing money, but now it's like a whole nother level. Holy crap, his children's children are not going to have to work. It's incredible. Uh, And I ask you, for anyone, I, I, I myself am very skeptical of this contract. I go, really? Kyler Murray, that much money? Like, I, I'm even in that boat, but I will, I want to counter even my own thinking and say, well, um, let's pause and ask, you know, what are the Arizona Cardinals without Kyler Murray? 
And how easy is he to replace? I mean, look, there are some exciting quarterbacks in college football right now, but there's just not a lot of Kyler Murray's running around the league. And I will say, I don't think he's earned this contract yet. I I think, you know, based on what he's done in his three years as an NFL quarterback, I don't see a guy who's worth $230.5 million. That seems absurd. However, as the years go on, he might eventually earn that money. He's super talented. I think he's one of the more talented quarterbacks in the NFL with his ability to run around. He's got a massive arm. Um, But I I just, I have a hard time going, yeah, this guy, Kyler, he should be the the second highest paid quarterback by yearly average in the NFL. I I just don't, I I have a hard time feeling that way. What's going to be really interesting is in five to seven years when we look back on this contract, are we going to go, hmm, you know, they overpaid Kyler Murray. Or are we going to say, okay, that makes sense. Is it kind of like when Baltimore paid Joe Flacco a massive contract? I mean, that one didn't work out at all. So we'll see. I'm really excited as time goes on to see how Kyler Murray plays, to see what Arizona does, and to kind of determine whether or not he ends up earning the money he's getting paid. Um, You know, I will say Kyler Murray's playoff loss to the Rams in January— I think it was in January, um, was really embarrassing. He he appeared to lack leadership, and he kind of wilted in a really big moment when you need your quarterback to show up. It would be really, really hard for me to give a guy I watched do that, not have leadership, and, and really not show up in the biggest moment of the year, to give that guy $230.5 million. Um, that... Feels a bit absurd. Feels a bit hard for me. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember that it's a different NFL now, and there's more money than ever before. Every quarterback from here on out that gets paid is going to be making more money than you can even imagine. It's just a different era of the NFL, but I'm still having a hard time accepting that. I'm like, ah, I don't like it. I also don't like the way it went down that Kyler Murray basically had to beg for the contract. He scrubbed Arizona from his social media. He put out this weird statement. If you have to beg to be paid, I, I think it, that, that's a, a weird, like, I, I think of Lamar Jackson, who's won an NFL MVP, who's won a playoff game. It's weird they won't pay him because he's earned it by every account. What has Kyler Murray done? He's not as accomplished. And I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't like the way the whole thing played out. He's only been in the league for three years. He already wants to get paid. I just, ah, I don't know, man. I, I try to remember it's a different NFL, but it's still like, if this is what you pay Kyler Murray, what are you going to pay Joe Burrow? Who turned around the Bengals, took them to a Super Bowl? Like if this is what Kyler Murray is worth, can you imagine what Joe Burrow is worth? It's kind of where I just like in my head, I'm like, I don't really understand this. And I, I know that, um, Here's the thing. Kyler Murray makes Arizona Cardinals more exciting and more interesting. Better in prime time. They're going to sell more jerseys, sell more tickets. Kyler Murray is good for business for the Arizona Cardinals, for sure. But is he going to win a Super Bowl? Ah, I don't know. I don't think so. I'm not convinced he's going to win a Super Bowl, and I'm not convinced he's even a good leader. Time will tell. But remember, Kyler Murray, like I said before, he has never won a playoff game. So it's weird to give that guy that much money, in my opinion. Uh, I want to talk about the numbers real quick, because in 2022, he's only a $12.6 million salary cap. That's not bad at all. Uh, Next year in 2023, he's only costing Arizona $16 million uh, with the new salary, salary cap. Then the new contract kicks in. Now, according to SpotTrack.com, S-P-O-T-R-A-C, SpotTrack.com, here are the salary cap hits for the five-year extension he just signed. In 2024, Kyler Murray is going to be a $51.8 million salary cap hit. It's a big jump. In 2025, $45.6 million salary cap hit. In 2026, $55.5 million salary cap hit in 2027, 43.5, and in 2028, $46.3 million 
dollar salary cap hit. You are giving a massive amount of money every year to Kyler Murray. I hope it's worth it. I, I really, really hope it's worth it. I just ask, are they going to be able to pay the people around him? I remember when Russell Wilson signed a really, really big contract with Seattle. And I kind of went, man, I wish, I wish, I know it's weird to say, I wish, I remember thinking, like, I wish Russ would have taken a little bit less money so they could build a better team around him. And I, I'm just, like I said, I'm not, I'm not used to this generation of quarterbacks who are scrubbing teams from their Instagram and putting out statements how they want to be paid and begging for money and then, you know, really just making their team pay them the entire earth. I mean, I just can't, like I said, if this is what Kyler Murray's worth, then what is Joe Burrow worth? It's going to be an insanely big contract if he plays it the same way. I'd like to think Joe Burrow values winning a little bit more and isn't going to, you know, destroy the future of his team by making them pay him like a, a gigantic chunk of the salary cap. I don't know. I, at one point is, is enough money enough. And I'm happy for Kyler. I just worry that is Arizona going to be able to pay the people around him? Are they going to be able to build a good team around him? Are they going to win a Super Bowl? I actually don't think so. I think what's going to happen, here's my prediction for this contract. Kyler Murray's a star quarterback. It's going to be awesome. He's going to be fun to watch. He's going to win a lot of games. He's going to sell a lot of jerseys, sell a lot of tickets. Kyler Murray's going to make the Cardinals more interesting for years to come. I don't think they're going to win a Super Bowl. And I think we're going to look back on this contract and go, wow, you know, Kyler's really good. I don't know that he wasn't overpaid, though. I think we're going to look back and go, I think Kyler was overpaid a little bit. I think he kind of grabbed Arizona by the the gonads, we'll say, and squeezed them for everything they got. And uh, I, I think that, unfortunately, this contract is going to hurt the Cardinals franchise. And if they win a Super Bowl, I will eat my words and go, wow, I, I was totally wrong. But think of there are a lot of quarterbacks that never win a Super Bowl that are, are star players that do really well. Uh, and I think that's going to be Kyler. Kyler is going to be fun and exciting and good for a, I think Phoenix is a smaller market from what I know. So they're certainly not New York. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I think he's just going to make them more exciting and, and sell a lot of jerseys and be good for business and probably not ever win a Super Bowl. And I hope that uh, I'm wrong, but it'll be really fun. This, this contract in particular, when Josh Allen signed a big contract and went, that makes sense. I love that. When Patrick Mahomes got a big contract, I said, yep, he's earned it. I don't know that Kyler Murray has earned it just yet. As time goes on, he very well may earn the contract. He might earn the amount of money he's getting paid. But right now I go, that's an absurd amount of money to pay a guy that has never won a playoff game. And in fact, in the one playoff game he played and looked horrendous and looked like a terrible leader and wilted. So uh, I just think it's a weird amount of money to pay to a guy who hasn't accomplished enough in the NFL to, to deserve that much money. And like I said, this is the, the whole theme of my topic on this is that my angle, time will tell. As time goes on, we will learn very quickly whether he earned it or not. And it'll be really fun to look back on in five to seven years. All right. Uh, we've got a question on Patreon from Zachariah. You can write into the show as well. Go to patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler. It's a dollar a month. Please do. It really helps out your boy, Zach. Zachariah says, hey, Zach. What in the world is happening with Lamar Jackson? It's the middle of July, and he's about to go into training camp on his fifth-year option with no extension. This is, this is absurd, right? I don't believe there's ever been a player on a rookie contract to win MVP, then walk in free agency. Will Lamar be the first? Will Baltimore pay him, or will he request a trade like Orlando Brown and Hollywood Brown? If he does not play for the Ravens after his rookie contract, where do you see him going realistically? And where do you see him going that would be the best fit? Okay. Um, first of all, I, I cannot imagine a scenario where the Ravens allow Lamar Jackson to leave their franchise. It's just not going to happen. I just don't see it happening at all. But let's let's have a little fun for a second. Let's imagine... That the Ravens are idiots and they don't keep Lamar Jackson. They let the guy walk away in free agency. 
Where would it be? Where would it be fun to see him play? Well, uh, I think about my my pie in the sky dream scenario is: Can you imagine Lamar Jackson in Miami? He went to high school north of Miami. They're his hometown team, and then Mike McDaniel's the offensive head coach there. He's a genius when it comes to run design. He's really good at designing running plays. And so let's say Tua doesn't work out in Miami. And then somehow the Ravens are dumb enough to let Lamar Jackson walk away. I would give almost anything to see Lamar Jackson play for the Miami Dolphins for Mike McDaniels. Um, That would just be a blast. I hope that happens. I think it'd be incredible. It's not going to happen, but you ask me where could he go that would be fun. That's the team that comes to mind right away is I want to see Lamar in Miami. Now, he's not going to leave Baltimore. The Ravens are not going to let him leave. They'll franchise tag him. They'll pay him. They'll keep him happy. I think what's happening right now is they're just waiting to see how the year goes. Uh, they're in no hurry to pay him a big contract. Remember, Lamar Jackson is more accomplished than Kyler Murray. He's actually won a playoff game. He's won an NFL MVP. But the weird thing is you can actually argue that in spite of that, Kyler Murray might be a better passer than Lamar Jackson, which is weird, but also true. Um, and, and like I said, I, you know, there are more quarterbacks who are going to be paid soon. At some point, Joe Burrow is going to get paid. Justin Herbert's going to get paid. Um, and I really didn't like the way Kyler Murray begged to be paid. So, you know, putting out a, a statement, scrubbing his team from his Instagram. I thought Lamar Jackson has done a really good job by just letting his play speak for himself. Hey, I'm going to win NFL MVP. Hey, I'm going to beat the Titans in a playoff game. So I think on, you know, Lamar has done everything he can to earn a contract by playing really well on the field. But there's a couple things that are going to affect his negotiations that are interesting. Remember, he got hurt last year. And so the Ravens, if they want to, could say, well, you got hurt last year. We don't want to pay a guy who's injury prone. I'm not saying they will say that, but you could make that argument and it wouldn't be entirely crazy. Then also, remember, the Ravens just traded away his top receiver, Marquise Brown. And by the way, when I say injury prone isn't crazy, I'm saying it would make sense for the Ravens to use that in negotiations where they are trying to use everything in their power to not pay Lamar Jackson $300 million. Like they're trying to do what they can to reduce the cost. So in negotiations, they're going to use something like, hey, he got hurt last year as a negotiation tactic. Now, Here's another thing that really hurts Lamar Jackson. Like I said, they just traded away his top receiver, Marquise Hollywood Brown. So on paper, I think Lamar may not have as good a year this year as he's had in recent years because the receiving core around him isn't as good. The job is harder for Lamar this year than in years past. And so I just, we'll see what happens with Lamar. Uh, I think they're waiting to see if anything happens, it reduces the cost because the Ravens just really are trying to not have to pay Lamar the biggest contract in NFL history. But what's really bad for them is that Kyler Murray got, you know, $230.5 million and he's not even ever won a playoff game. When you look at what Lamar has done compared to Kyler, Lamar Jackson is way, way, way more accomplished and way more deserving in my opinion of that much money. So, um, I think, I think, Kyler Murray getting paid just really, really screwed the Baltimore Ravens. They're going to have to shell out a lot of money to, you know, to pay Lamar Jackson if Lamar wants that much money. If I'm Lamar, I like take 200 million. I don't take a little less so you can have better help. I just, I, I think every quarterback, I, 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 the thing I don't connect with with this generation of quarterbacks, the thing that I don't quite understand about this era of the NFL in general is quarterbacks getting paid you know, like a hundred times more than their running back. Like insane things like that where you're like, you know, your running back's getting paid a rookie contract for four years and getting cut and you're getting paid $230 million. I just, it's a bit uncomfortable for me. I I, I would have a hard time um, making that much more than everybody else in the building. I just would be like, man, I, and also... I, I would really want the people around me to get paid. Like I, I would, I'm telling you what, man, I would want to win a lot of games and I'd say, Hey, how do we get this receiver? 
can I take a pay cut so we can pay that guy? I would do that in a heartbeat. And this generation of quarterbacks is, uh, there's a different mindset here where they, they just are all about getting paid as much money as humanly possible. And I, it's hard to, it's hard to nag on that, but money's never been a, I've turned down a lot of, a lot of sponsorship deals. Cause I don't take, you know, gambling sponsorships at all. So I've, I've never in my career been like a mercenary and just taking the money. And some of these NFL quarterbacks, man, they just have different values than me apparently, because they, they would rather make bucket loads of money than win football games. It seems like, and, uh, that's not a, a comment on Lamar Jackson. Actually, if anything, it's more of a comment on Kyler Murray, who I'm, I have a hard time connecting with now that I, I just like, I don't, I don't know why you needed that much money when you haven't really earned it and you kind of had to beg for it. Uh, I respect the way that Lamar Jackson has handled everything where he just keeps balling out. He keeps playing really well in the field and he hasn't made any crazy drastic moves to request a contract or demand anything. And he's made it clear he wants to be paid. Sure. But um, I think that's just because, like I said, it's like Zachariah said in the write in on Patreon, it's pretty absurd that Lamar Jackson is entering the last year of his rookie contract with no extension when he's already, again, he won an MVP and a playoff game by 23 years old. That That's way weirder than Kyler Murray's situation. So um, I hope Kyle, I hope Lamar Jackson gets paid. I hope he gets paid generational wealth and never needs to work again after football and his kids don't have to work and his kids' kids don't have to work. But um, it, it is still weird for me. Like I said, this generation of quarterbacks, the, the focus on money seems to be way greater than the focus on even winning. And I just don't quite connect with that. All right. Um, here's a sad story. I need to take a deep breath for this one. Um, Texans rookie receiver John Mechie has leukemia. Here is a statement that John Mechie put out. He says this. Recently, I was diagnosed with APL. Acute promyelocytic leukemia. I think I got that right. Promyelocytic. APL, which is the most curable form of leukemia. I am currently receiving great medical care, am in good spirits, and I expect to make a recovery at a later point in time. As a result of this diagnosis, I will likely not be playing football this year. My main focus will be on my health and recovery. Thank you in advance for your support and well wishes. I cannot wait to come back stronger than ever. God bless. That one's sad. Uh, from what I know... Uh, from what I understand, I guess, is that leukemia is a form of cancer. It, it's blood cancer, basically. And I just, you know, football aside for a second, I, I hope John Mechie comes out okay. That That's, it sounds like he's got confidence. They say it's the most uh, curable form, which is pretty cool. But I wouldn't want to have leukemia. Like, I just, I feel really bad for the guy. That's a horrible thing to have to deal with at that young of an age and, um, at any age, really. I mean, there's no, how do you say that? I mean, it's, it's it's awful. So um, I hope that John Mechie comes out okay. If, in case you don't know, I, I think of football and how does this affect the Houston Texans. Remember, uh, John Mechie was a second-round pick by the Houston Texans. He was a star receiver at Alabama. And I'm, I'm kind of sad here because I was excited to watch the guy play in Houston. I thought he was a good draft pick. Him and Davis Mills would have been fun to watch. And uh, just unfortunate. You know, I, I really hope that, um, I, hope he, I hope he lives, hope he makes it through okay. It sounds like they're overwhelmingly positive, which is good. You're the most curable. Sounds like a good thing. I don't know anything about it, really. Um, but there's potential here for a really cool story. Can you imagine if he comes back from leukemia and becomes like a, a really great NFL receiver? I mean, that would be a wild story that would be really impressive. So, um, I don't know. John Mechie, I I'm thinking about the guy. I hope he does well. I hope he, he's doing okay. I, I think everyone out there is just rooting for him to succeed and um, you know, health is more important than football for sure. Uh, but it would also be pretty cool if somehow he recovered from leukemia and then came back and was somehow is the wrong word, way, word to put there, but, uh, it'd be cool if he recovered from leukemia and then became a, you know, a, a top notch NFL receiver. That would be a crazy story. So, um, I hope he's good, but B, the groundwork is being laid for a potential comeback and a really cool story here. So I just, I'm rooting for the guy. I hope he does well. And, um, I hope he comes out all right, man. Like I said, leukemia, horrible thing to have to deal with. I'm lucky. I don't know anyone that's ever had it. It's never, uh, you know, my, my best friend's mom has had breast cancer. That's scary. But other than that, 
I've never had to deal with cancer very closely. And uh, I'm just really, really fortunate and glad that that's a thing I can say. And I, it's really awful that John Metchie's got to deal with this because I, I would not at all want to deal with having leukemia. That sounds like a horrible thing. And uh, I'm just thinking about the guy and wishing him well. All right. I'm going to drink a, uh, take a drink of water. Almost a drink a glass of water, which I'm not drinking an entire glass. That sounds horrible. It is now time for a segment that I like. It's the biggest one we've ever done. I call this segment sports screenshots. I see cool stuff on Instagram and I share it here. I go through it. I got an album on my phone. Sports screenshot number one is about Tom Brady. It was posted by Bucks Tracker, the Instagram account. Tom Brady is more likely to take his team to a championship game 70% than any quarterback is likely to complete a pass. So he's more likely to take his team to the Super Bowl than even any quarterback is likely to complete a single pass on any given play. That is ridiculous, uh, first of all. That's a crazy Tom Brady stat. But second of all, I don't know about you. Tom Brady's my favorite player of all time. I love Tom Brady with a passion. He inspired me as a kid. I love the guy. But I was ready to say goodbye when he retired. I really was. I was like, okay, you know, thanks, Tom, for the memories. It was incredible. Emotionally, I kind of moved on. And I'm like, well, now that Tom Brady's gone, Joe Burrow is my favorite quarterback in the NFL. So if even I have a little bit of Tom Brady burnout here, I'm a little bit like, yeah, look, Tom Brady's good for the league. He makes things more interesting. The more good quarterbacks you have in the NFL, the better. I'm all for it. But even I am a little bit like, man, is this guy ever going to stop? I'm a little bit tired of seeing Tom Brady everywhere all the time. And he's my favorite player of all time. I cannot even imagine how someone who hates Tom Brady must feel. I am so sorry to you guys because I'm feeling burned out and I love the guy. I can't imagine someone who doesn't like Tom Brady. So, um, yeah, I just, can you, can you imagine if Tom Brady won another Super Bowl this year? And, and he keeps saying, you know, I, I, I say I'm playing only one more year, but I'm taking it one year at a time and reserve the right to change my mind. Tom Brady's the highest rated quarterback in Madden this year. <laughs> what? What? Still? He's not going anywhere. It's just, I, it's, I don't know. I, I'm feeling a little bit of Tom Brady burnout, and I I just can't imagine how other people who don't like him must feel. Because I love the guy, and I even am like, ugh. I'm just, it's a lot of Tom Brady everywhere all the time. Okay, screenshot number two is a picture from Jaden Daniels. Um, I don't really care about the caption. I don't really care about what he posted. It's him in an LSU uniform. I realize, so... Either last episode, 390 or 492 or 491, I talked about college quarterbacks I'm excited to watch this fall. And I, I looked at this picture the other day on Instagram and I went, oh gosh, there's a couple guys I left out. And so here they are. Uh, I'm excited to watch Jaden Daniels at LSU. He transferred from Arizona State to go play for uh, LSU and they got a new coach from Notre Dame, Brian Kelly. Um, I'm so excited to watch Jaden Daniels this year in the SEC, a guy who's got NFL potential for sure. Uh, and I just, I think he's going to make the SEC even better and even more exciting. Then you got Bo Nix at Oregon. He left Auburn to go to Oregon. Um, I, I look, I think he looks great in Oregon uniform. I think he, him running that offense, running around. And I think it's very possible Bo Nix turns a lot of heads this year at Oregon and, you know, shows that he's a first round pick actually like straight up. I, that's what I'm rooting for to happen. We'll see if he does that. I'm not going to force it. If he doesn't do that, he doesn't do it. But, um, personally, I want to see Bo Nix become a star and really develop as a quarterback and, uh, show what he can do. And I, I I'm hoping that's what he does at Oregon. Then at Fresno state, you got Jake Hayner, this guy who he's throwing back shoulder fades and, you know, doing all kinds of crazy stuff with the football. I love Jake Hayner. He's awesome. Um, he'll be fun to watch this year. Uh, Cam Rising at Utah is incredible. Cam Rising, my favorite thing about Cam Rising is he's got this quality where when the pressure gets turned up, when the game is at the most important moment, he's calm, he's cool, he's collected, he's not even bothered. He is very, very comfortable in high-pressure situations. And I 
That's the thing I just love about this guy, Cam Rising at Utah, and I'm excited to watch him. I can't believe I didn't mention him last time. Then you got DTR, Dorian Thompson Robinson at UCLA. This guy, DTR, is one of the most talented quarterbacks in college football. Straight up. Physically gifted, huge arm, just an unbelievable arm. Um, And yet, for whatever reason, I've been waiting for years now for him to put it all together, and it hasn't happened. And so... I, I've said the same thing for like four years in a row. Maybe this is the year that Dorian Thompson Robinson shows that he's a first round pick. I don't know that he will, but I'm hoping he certainly has the talent. Can he show the consistency and the work ethic? I don't know. I, I worry he's the kind of kid like he would have popped by now. Right. It's kind of how I feel like you if if he was going to become a star, it would have happened by now. And it makes me worry about like, is he? not working hard like what's going on there why why is this guy not becoming the star i think he's capable of but i will say you know once again this could be the year i've got an open mind and um you know i i think it's very possible that this is the year that dtr shows the world that he's a first round talent and i i hope i hope he shows that uh, there's one other quarterback talia tongue of aloha uh the brother of tua he's at maryland he's fun to watch he can run he can throw got a big arm um and then I'll throw like an honorable mention out to Sam Hartman at Wake Forest. Sam Hartman is a guy uh, I like a lot. He, uh, I don't know that he's an NFL quarterback. He's kind of fringe, but uh, I think I actually did talk about him last episode. If there was an award for most handsome quarterback in the NFL or in college football, Sam Hartman would win that. I, I show pictures of him to like girls I know, and they're like, oh my gosh, that guy's incredible. So like, I, I'm not crazy. Uh, Sam Hartman weird thing to say most handsome quarterback in college football but to me i just like dude i I wish i had that jawline i I respect the guy a lot (laughs) what a weird thing to say i don't give a i don't care um okay screenshot number three uh it's from sports center a guy real talk posted it on twitter fun fact michael jordan had more 40 plus point games than games where he scored less than 20 points let me say that one more time there are more games in Michael Jordan's career where he scored more than, you know, 40 points or more than there are games where he scored less than 20 points. He was putting it out there every single night, just dominating, scoring points, points left and right, going crazy. And I, man, I wish I could have seen Michael Jordan play in his prime. I, I really would love to see that. Um, I, I was not alive during that time of his career. And I'd love to see the guy play today. I really, you know, I'd love to see Michael Jordan in a different era of basketball play. I'd love to see people like LeBron James go back and play in the older generations with different rules. I mean, that's the thing with basketball that everyone gets caught up in the GOAT debate. This guy's the greatest of all time. And no, it's this guy. No, it's this guy. It's like, well, no, you know, there are so many different eras and generations of basketball that I don't, I have a hard time comparing them all across. Um, I certainly don't blame anybody who says that Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time. I I think that's fair enough. Happy to let you believe that. I don't really know what I believe. I just kind of go back to, I I like all of them equally. And I really appreciate every great player from every generation. I try to equally. Um, But man, I'm I'm really sad. I never got to see Michael Jordan play live. Like that would have been, you can go back and watch it on YouTube and you can go back, but it's, it's different when you're in the moment. And you're watching live with your friends and you're reading the newspaper the next day and you're you're a part of that cultural phenomenon. I'll never be able to do that with Michael Jordan. And that makes me a little bit sad that I missed out on that. I just, I wasn't born early enough to, to really be a part of that and kind of breaks my heart a little bit. Okay, number four, CBS Sports put this out there. Uh, ben Lieber, a former Vikings linebacker, went on CBS Sports Radio and gave this quote about Kirk Cousins. He said, I think he, Kirk, He's finally going to thrive, really thrive in a system and with a coach that actually respects him. It's not like I'm breaking news here that Mike Zimmer did not like Kirk Cousins. And uh, man, I, I'm i excited to watch Kirk Cousins this year. I think he's potentially going to have a breakout year or maybe the best year of his career. And that leads me to a question on Patreon. Remember, go to patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler. It's a dollar a month. That is how you write into the show. ETN says this on Patreon. Hey, Zach. First time joining the Patreon and plan to stay. Here's something about me. 
I am a massive defender and truther of Kirk Cousins. I feel as he is easily the most disrespected quarterback in the NFL. He's one of the most accurate quarterbacks in the NFL and it's been for years. You can check the Twitter account at quarterback data mine and search up Kirk. He takes care of the football and in 2020 played behind an offensive line that was ranked fourth worst in pass blocking and sixth worst in 2021. He has had a notoriously bad offensive line that makes it way tougher to play quarterback. In spite of that, he still puts up high completion percentages, is extremely consistent, rarely turns the football over, and still remains very accurate with pressure in his face. He is the last of the problems on the Minnesota Vikings. If you or anyone else still has skepticism, read this stat. The Minnesota Vikings would have went 15-2 and last year if they didn't give up any points within the final two minutes of either half of any of their losses last year. He does have great he does have great wide receivers and has had them, so you can't argue that. But Zach, I want to know your opinion on Kirk Cousins before and after reading this post. Do you think he is a top 15 quarterback when evaluating the positional group as a whole? I think he is top 10, but curious on your thoughts as a whole. Is Kirk top 10, top 15? I don't care. I really don't care about the distinction. You're kind of splitting hairs there. Um, okay, I, I got one problem with Kirk Cousins we'll talk about in a second. However, uh, I'm so excited to watch Kirk Cousins in a new offense this year. Kevin O'Connell is head coach. He's a former quarterback who worked with Sean McVay. And I look at this new situation with Kevin O'Connell and the next couple of years ahead for Kirk. Uh, this is the best opportunity Kirk Cousins is ever going to get in his career where I think he could produce similar to Matt Ryan's MVP season with Kyle Shanahan calling the plays. He's got Dalvin Cook at running back, receiver Justin Jefferson, and Adam uh, Thielen out wide. They're both awesome. And Mike Zimmer was not a quarterback-friendly coach. He's a defensive guy that saw offense as a... You know, Mike Zimmer saw the offense as an obstacle rather than a weapon. He's a defensive guy who just, we want to run the ball and protect the football and... He wasn't aggressive. He didn't trust the quarterback. He didn't want them to throw the ball very much. Was it about Kirk? Maybe. I think Mike Zimmer just wouldn't have really liked any quarterback he's had because he doesn't trust quarterbacks at all. Um, So, uh, like I said, that's my my opinion and impression is that Kirk is, you know, poised to potentially have the best year of his career this year. Um, And I'm really happy because it's been a long time since Kirk was really put in a position to be massively successful the coach who believed in him and built an offense to fit him and let him let him kind of shine um although I will say this man here's my problem with Kirk Cousins other than the fact that Kirk Cousins is a really clunky name and hard to say the problem is that I think he gets really tense and nervous in big moments uh, you know I, I look back to the moment where he kneeled it once instead of spiked it and you think about you know I think it was the Bears game last year with a really bad pick six I mean there are moments where was it last year? Was it two years ago? I don't know. There, there are moments where optically Kirk Cousins struggles in big moments. And I think it's because he gets really excited and pent up and nervous and doesn't know how to manage those nerves very well. I think he probably needs to talk to a sports psychologist who would help him a lot. Um, but that's my deal with Kirk Cousins. It's not that he's bad. He's certainly really good. Um, but I don't know that he's the kind of guy I want to have the football with two minutes left in the fourth quarter. Certainly he's not the first person I would think of in that scenario. And uh, I don't know. I just, I really hope that Kirk can have a great year and change the narrative about him this year and really just show the world that um, in the right offense with a coach that believes in him, he can be incredible. But again, I go back to like, there are moments where Kirk is at opportunities at the end of games or in big moments. And when the pressure's on, I think he gets in those in his own head a lot and kind of wilts. And uh that's that's a problem. And I don't know what you do about that. I just that that's an honest thing that I think is a problem for Kirk Cousins in general. All right. Um, how about screenshot number five? We're still on sports screenshots. Ryan Switzer has retired. Ryan Switzer put this on Instagram. He said, This game of football has changed my life. When I began my journey at 10 years old, I could only dream of how far it would take me. I've dedicated the last 17 years to maximizing the gifts that God granted me. I promised myself at the beginning of my journey I would not shy away from the dedication and commitment that it would take to achieve my goals. From my days at North Carolina to my 
five years in the NFL. I never deviated from that promise. Unfortunately, in light of a recent injury, I feel I'm no longer able to meet the physical demands of the game. That said, I've decided to retire from the NFL. I want to thank my teammates and coaches from every level and each organization that provided me an opportunity to play. I want to thank my parents for their unwavering support and my wonderful wife, who has been my rock since the day we met. Although my playing days are over, I'm looking forward to using the knowledge and experience I've accumulated to help the next generation of players through coaching. I promise to bring the same relentless mindset that enabled me to live my dream of playing NFL football to this next chapter of my life. I really, really love Ryan Switzer. Uh, he's kind of an obscure player that not everyone's going to know about. Uh, you probably had never even heard of him, potentially. He played at North Carolina. He had a brief NFL career. He played for the Cowboys, the Raiders, the Steelers, the Browns. He was basically a return guy or like a speedster guy. He had 63 kick returns and 67 punt returns for a total of 1,910 return yards. Uh, 50 catches for 321 yards and a touchdown in his receiving career in the NFL. And I loved this guy. I really, when he came out of the, came into the NFL, I was excited to see what he could potentially do. I wanted to see him play with maybe Tom Brady or the Patriots because he's a kind of Julian Edelman size speedster guy who I think in the slot could have been awesome. Um, and I, I maybe the only reason I'm bringing this guy up actually is because I loved using Ryan Switzer on Madden. He was so quick and good. And I, every time I played a franchise mode, I would always trade for him and make him my slot receiver and just develop and have a lot of fun with him. And, uh, I respect Ryan Switzer a lot. I wish him the best. I hope he does well. I hope he's a great coach. I'm sure he will be. And, uh, I'm excited for his future. All right, let's get into the helmets. Um, <laughs> the Carolina Panthers got alternate black helmets. This is the first of many, many helmet announcements during this episode. Uh, I think the Panthers got one of the coolest ones. So I love the Panthers all black uniforms. I love the Carolina blue. I'm a big fan of that. Uh, so that's the first one. Then we've got a bunch of other ones. But before we get into the other helmets, let's talk about some other stuff. Uh, first of all, I found a crazy box score from December 8, 2002. This was, I believe, the inaugural season of the... Yeah, maybe not. I don't remember. I, I thought the Houston Texans began in 2000, so maybe ignore what I just said. But regardless, this is one of the craziest box scores I've ever seen. This was posted by CBS Sports. On December 8, 2002, the Houston Texans beat the Pittsburgh Steelers 24-6. to And yet, the Houston Texans offense had a total of 47 yards with three first downs. They were awful. The Steelers' offense, 422 total yards and 24 first downs, and yet somehow Houston won 24-6, even though the Steelers' offense performed at a way higher level. But the Texans' defense scored three touchdowns and forced five turnovers. So just an interesting, weird story. I'd love to go back and watch that game. I'm really curious. What the heck happened? Like, you know, five turnovers is horrible. So how many interceptions were thrown? How many fumbles were there? What happened there? But it's very rare you see a team win a game with a lopsided score where the offenses are vastly opposingly successful. Uh, Larry Fitzgerald, a legendary NFL player, gave a quote about Heinz Ward that I love. NFL legend Larry Fitzgerald reveals passionate thoughts on Steelers wide receiver Heinz Ward making the Hall of Fame. By the way, this was posted by the Berg News. Here is the quote Larry Fitzgerald gave about Heinz Ward. He said, You can't tell the story of the Pittsburgh Steelers without Heinz Ward and his contributions he's made to the organization. He embodied the toughness of Mel Blount's, uh, of the Mel Blount's and the Joe Greens and Terry Bradshaw's and Franco Harris's. That's a lot of names. I don't know why you have to do that in the quote. You can't tell the story of the 2000s and not speak of Heinz Ward and what he's done. And I think he deserves to be immortalized forever. I agree with you, Heinz Ward. And I, I, sorry, Larry Fitzgerald. Larry Fitzgerald feels that way about Heinz Ward. And that's kind of like if Tony Hawk gave you an endorsement as a skateboarder. You're like, hey, because of how good Larry Fitzgerald was and how legendary he is, um, his opinion has a lot of weight to me. Heinz Ward, I, I love the guy. He was born in Seoul, South Korea. He played in 217 games in 14 years in the NFL. He was a Super Bowl MVP. He won two Super Bowls in his time in the league. 
He's got 1,000 catches, which is 14th all-time in receiving, uh, 12,083 yards, that's 27th all-time as a receiver, and 85 touchdowns, he's tied for 16th all-time. To me, uh, he's maybe not the most accomplished, but he's definitely in the conversation, and to me, Heinz Ward is a Hall of Famer for sure. I love the guy, and uh, I hope he gets into the Hall of Fame. All right, here's a crazy stat I found about the Sacramento Kings. Uh, Hoop Central put this out there. No active player has ever faced the Sacramento Kings in the playoffs. Somebody tagged me in this screenshot. They're like, this would be good for the show. Um, that's unbelievable to me. There's not a single active player in the NBA who's ever play, played the Sacramento Kings in the NBA playoffs. The last time the Kings made the playoffs was in 2006, where they lost to the Spurs in the first round of the NBA playoffs. And, uh, you know, the last time they won a playoff series, by the way, was 2004. So it's been a long, long time that the Kings have been just absolutely atrocious. Here's a cool story. Um, JJ Watt found a lady, a lady, Jennifer put this on Instagram, on, on Twitter. She says, uh, she was trying to sell some JJ Watts shoes and a Jersey to raise money for her grandfather's funeral. And, uh, the amount of money, you know, she, the shoes she was selling for 60 bucks and the Jersey for 30 bucks. That's, I don't know how $90 really helps pay for a funeral, but whatever each their own. Um, JJ Watt, and, and look, I'm, I'm not, a, I've never, I've never paid for a funeral site. So I really have no idea. Um, JJ Watt though, responded with something really cool. He said, don't sell your shoes and Jersey. We'll help with the funeral. I'm sorry for your loss. And that's just, I love JJ Watt being kind when a guy's got a lot of money and has the ability to help people and does the way JJ Watt does. I find that really admirable. And JJ Watt is one of the most giving and uh, generous athletes of a generation. And I really love how he's used all the money he's made as a player and found creative ways over and over and over again to donate and help other people. And I just really, really admire that and love that about him. Okay. Uh, the Berg news also put this on Instagram. Heinz Field is back. Kind of. Uh, the Steelers and Heinz have agreed to a five-year contract keeping the Heinz red zone at Acrisure Stadium, potentially bringing back the ketchup bottles. So it was kind of sad when Heinz Field uh, in, in Pittsburgh got changed, their name got changed. There are like videos of the, the ketchup bottles being taken out of the stadium that are you know, big in the stadium for a long time, and they were up in the end zone. <laughs> and so I, you know, I was pretty, I hate the name Acrisure Stadium. I think it's, it's an insurance company. You're like, ugh, I just don't care. Um, and so to see the Heinz name stick around a little bit in uh, in Pittsburgh, that makes me happy because I, I really, I'm not even a Steelers fan at all. I'm not from Pittsburgh. I got no connection to Pittsburgh, but it was weird to hear Heinz Field is changing their name. I was like, man, that feels pretty wrong and weird to me. All right, uh, Adam Schefter put this on Instagram. Cleveland deciding former first round quarterback Josh Rosen to a one-year deal per sources. Despite spending time with five other NFL teams, Josh Rosen is only 25 years old, and those who have been around him believe he is ready to prove he belongs. Um, yeah, man, Josh Rosen is going to Cleveland. He's had a lot of chances. He's been in Arizona, Miami, Tampa, Atlanta. There must be another team. I, I don't... Is, is, is Cleveland the fifth, or is there another one I'm not, I'm not thinking of right now? Um... How about a guy who did not live up to his expectations and, and you know, his own personally and the expectations other people had of him as well? Um, I would love to interview Josh Rosen to hear his thoughts on, um, you know, what <laughs> I just I don't know, man. I, what What is his perspective on his NFL career? And maybe it'll be when he retires, we'll have that conversation. But I um, I'd love to get the guy on camera talking about. Um, what he thinks about his NFL career because it's so interesting and fascinating the story uh, of his career and how he's what's happened to him and um, you know he was drafted in the first round to be a franchise quarterback then replaced after one year by Kyler Murray who just signed in you know, the second biggest contract in the NFL Kyler Murray's been a massive hit in Arizona Josh Rosen is now on like you know his, his fifth NFL team basically in Cleveland and uh Oh man, I just I just wish good things for Josh Rosen and I 
I don't know if it's humility. I don't know if he doesn't love the game. I don't know if it's all of it, but something hasn't worked for him. And I'm surprised by that because I really thought that whether it was Tampa or Atlanta or Miami, I thought every step of the way, I thought this is the time he's finally going to show he deserves it and belongs and, and find a spot. And the fact that somehow still Josh Rosen hasn't found a home in the NFL is surprising and weird and um, disappointing because he's a guy who clearly had a lot of talent coming out of college. All right. Um, more helmets. This is my favorite set of helmets uh, in the NFL. The Bengals have announced these white alternate helmets, which are the same classic Bengals helmets, but instead they're white instead of orange on top. And Oh, my goodness, it's beautiful. I, I could almost buy one of these and put them on a shelf somewhere. I really, really... I think they're going to sell them. I mean, that would be... This is the kind of helmet that I, I think is... If you're going to make alternate helmets, this is what you do. Everybody's making these black helmets. The Jets, the Eagles. All, but I like when teams do something truly alternative and truly... Um, alternative. I said that weird. Uh, but, I, you know, a black helmet is cool. I'm, I'm all for it, but... I, I would prefer even more creativity and what the Bengals have done with their white helmet. Really creative. I love that. The Eagles also got black helmets. Um, it's fine. It's a trend. Uh, everybody's got black helmets this year. The Eagles have a, have a black helmet. They're going to wear um, the Jets have a black helmet. I think a Jets black helmet's even better. They're going to wear them against the Patriots, the Bears and the Jaguars. Um I, I like the all-black uniforms, though. Uh, any team that wears all-black uniforms, I'm all for it. Again, I think it's really cool, and I like it. Um, but again, black is a bit unoriginal, and uh, I don't know. I, I like the more creative stuff. But again, I think I, I think the Jets' black helmet looks better than the Eagles' black helmet. I think uh, something about the whether you know the Carolina blue or the Jets' gang green. Like I like that green or that alternate color that stands off the black. I think it's really cool. Um, the Bears got orange helmets. They're going to wear some alternate orange jerseys. I like the orange helmets. I'm all for that. I don't know that the white pants look very good with the orange helmet, the orange jersey. I would rather see them wear orange helmet, orange jersey, and like, I don't know, dark navy pants or something. That dark blue on the bottom would be way cooler than the white. I think white and orange just look kind of hideous together, but that's my opinion. Um... Oh, look, the Arizona Cardinals also got black helmets. What? Yeah, the whole NFL is just going to have black helmets at some point, it seems like. Um, it's fine, though. So here are the alternate helmets for this year. The The Bengals have alternate white. The Bears have alternate orange. Hey, props to you guys. Did something creative and cool. Um, the Cowboys have alternate helmets. I like the Cowboys' alternate helmets. They got the, the Dallas Star on top. The white helmets are awesome. Uh, the Cardinals, the Commanders, the Jets, the Eagles, the Saints, and the Panthers all black helmets. The Texans have really cool red helmets. I like that. That's going to be awesome. And then there's a couple throwback helmets we got to talk about. Uh, the Cowboys throwback helmets are going to be really cool. The Giants throwback helmets. I like that. The best throwback helmets in the NFL are either the Atlanta Falcons with the the really cool red or the Patriots with the red jerseys and the white helmets and the old logo. I think Atlanta and New England have got the coolest alternate helmets and alternate jerseys probably, period, in the NFL. And I'm, oh, I'm such a big fan. Uh, here's another cool story from Sports Screenshots. Again, I told you, a long Sports Screenshots segment today. Uh, former Ohio State quarterback JT Barrett is going to join the Detroit Lions coaching staff as an offensive assistant, which I, I like to hear this. Um, I think the connection goes back to New Orleans when Dan Campbell and him were both in New Orleans uh, he was a player. Dan Campbell was a coach. Um, I, I meant maybe JT Barrett is the next, um, you know, JT Barrett might be the next great coach in football. I mean, I, you see a lot of former quarterbacks that are very successful as coaches. I think of Kevin O'Connell, Sean McVay, Kellen Moore, Doug Peterson, Frank Reich. There's a lot of quarterbacks who go on to be very good coaches. His career didn't really work as a player. He was fine. He, hung around the league and did the best he could, but now him as a coach, that excites me. And I think it's very possible five years from now, you're going to hear JT Barrett as a name getting thrown out there as a potential offensive coordinator or head coach. And that's how it works. But I, look, I, I like hearing about a guy who can transition after his playing career is over. He's found a way to stick around the game, make money, have a career, 
and uh, be involved with football and take care of his family. And I, I love, I love, love, love to see stories like this where a guy, like I said, finds a way to pay his bills, be around football, take care of his family, and not have to go be like an insurance salesman or something. And I, I love, love, love this story. Okay, uh, we got the logo for the 2023 MLB All-Star Game. It's going to be in Seattle. I didn't know that. I'm very excited. I really like... Um, I like living in the Northwest. Uh, I, I think I think I'm back, not permanently. Like I'll, I'm going to drive around and stuff, but um, the, the nor- Northwest is my home, and I think I'm going to go to the All Star Game next year if that's possible. Um, you know, the Mariners, the yeah, Seattle Mariners, are making me care about baseball and care about them. I, you know, I I am preparing to have heartbreak. The Mariners have been doing pretty well this year. The Seattle Mariners. I rant about them all the time. Uh, but I love their center fielder, Julio Rodriguez. He's a stud. He almost won the home run derby. Derby. He actually hit the most home runs during the actual home run derby. He hit 81 home runs. Juan Soto hit 53, but Juan Soto technically won the home run derby, which is like, I, whatever, that's weird and dumb. Um, to, to hit 81 home runs more than anyone else and lose the home run derby. Kind of kind of weird how it's structured, but whatever. Um, and I, I've made peace with the fact that Julio Rodriguez at some point uh, is going to leave probably the Mariners for a, a bigger contract the same way Alex Rodriguez did. I mean, it's only a matter of time before you see Julio Rodriguez playing for the Red Sox or the Yankees or someone else who's got a ton of money. It's not going to be the Mariners forever, but um, I'm trying to let myself enjoy watching him because he's so much fun. He's so cool to to watch. And uh, what an awesome player. He's had a really good effect on the Mariners, I believe. And um, man, I, I love seeing the guy play at the All-Star game and there was that moment where he, you know, the pitcher, there's a he gets the last out Julio Rodriguez does, and he almost throws in the stands, and the play, pitcher's like, no, I need that ball, Julio. Don't throw the ball, Julio. Like, I, I can't get enough of Julio Rodriguez. I like every moment I see with the guy. He's awesome. And uh, like I said, I just, I, I have made peace with the fact that I'm, I'm sure at some point he's going to gonna leave and go. But um, you know what? I ah, I love him. I love I love watching him play for the Mariners. Screenshot number 19, former USFL Generals quarterback Luis Perez is signing with the LA Rams. I love, love, love Luis Perez. I've talked about him for years. He was with the USFL, played for the Generals. Um, I met this guy briefly in New York when he played for the XFL New York Guardians. Um, This is actually his second stint with the LA Rams. And and here's why I love Luis Perez. He's got a really cool story, a story of resilience and um, of determination he won the Division II Heisman Trophy, whatever the equivalent is, right? He played Juco college football, but you would never know about him. He's an NFL quarterback, a professional football player who did not play high school football. He went to a high school where they had a wing T offense. So he got moved to blocking receiver and just stopped playing. So he didn't even play varsity football. Then he walked on at a junior college and started as the ninth string quarterback, worked all the way up to the starter there. Then he goes to... Texas A&M, I believe Kingsbury uh, in in uh, in Texas, obviously, and wins the D- Division II Heisman, goes on to play in the AAF, the XFL, the USFL. He's a fringe NFL quarterback. One of the coolest stories you've ever seen, I, I think, in football, and I'd love to interview him someday because there's so much adversity and so many moments where he had opportunities to walk away from the game, to not play the game, or didn't quite make it, and he kept fighting and he kept going, and he keeps getting opportunities at the professional level, He's traveled from coast to coast and I'm sure made a lot of money and had all kinds of adventures. And I just, I would love to hear Luis Perez's, you know, mindset on how football has impacted his life because he certainly has a really, really cool story. All right. The Checkdown put this idea out there on Instagram. They said uh, they should have a quote Heisman for offense and they Woodson for defense. Uh, That's a, a quote, a a ode to Charles Woodson, who is the last defensive player to win the Heisman Trophy. Um, I like that idea. I'm curious what you guys think because the Heisman Trophy at this point is basically, it's an offensive award. I mean, it, how long has it been since a defensive player really won the award? And uh, it's just because of how football works now, it's going to be a re- quarterback or receiver basically every year. Uh, they're the guys who put up the bigger numbers and the, the most impressive numbers. That or a running back. And uh, so I, I think the way you honor defense is make the Woodson Award a, a good way to 
make an award that honors the defensive players. I think of guys like Chase Young, Micah Parsons, Nick Bosa, Aiden Hutchins, and those are guys who potentially would have won. And uh, I don't know, man. It's really, um, I think it's a great idea to have the Woodson Award uh, respecting and honoring defensive players who are outstanding in college football. Okay, I believe this is the last one. It is. Uh, Number 21, our 21st sports screenshot today. Um, Cam Hayward gave a really good quote endorsing Mitchell Trubisky as the Steelers said, uh, Steelers starting quarterback. Here is what uh, I'm going to read the full quote on the Berg News. Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback Mitchell Trubisky received a big endorsement from his teammate and defensive lineman Cameron Hayward in his bid to be this team's to be the team's starting quarterback in 2022. Here's what Cam Hayward said. It starts with Mitch. Mitch, we brought him in in free agency. Uh, the thing is, we have to remember about Mitch is he's coming from a situation in Chicago where they didn't really give him anything. And he still made it to the playoffs. Everything uh, people like to say, you know, Mitch did this wrong. Mitch did that wrong. Man, Mitch did a lot of things right. Hopefully we have a better team around him and we're going to support him. Right now, he's our number one quarterback. Um So Cam Hayward supported Mitchell Trubisky as the Steelers starting quarterback. And I, you know, I I think in an NFL locker room, guys really, really respect a veteran quarterback. Someone who's been there before um, and someone who has experience that they feel like they can trust. So I I think there's no hurry for Kenny Pickett to be the starting quarterback in Pittsburgh. I, I would make him earn it if I was the Steelers. I think if it's close, I probably would go with Kenny Pickett, but there's a, a complication there, which is that if it's close, but Trubisky's actually better, you might have to go with a better quarterback, Trubisky, because if you don't, you're going to lose the other players in the locker room who are trying to win and fighting for their lives and trying to, you know, it's the worst thing you can do is is play a quarterback that the locker room isn't behind. And if the locker room is behind Mitchell Trubisky and he really is the better guy, then that's who you got to play early on in the season until uh, Kenny Pickett is eventually ready. All right, we got two topics left today. It's been a long show, kind of a, I don't know. H- have you liked it? I- I've been having a good time. For some reason, this one, like I said, this episode more than any other was just a brutal show to put together. It's taken me way too long and been really, really hard to, uh, like, I- this is my fourth time trying to record this episode. So here we are. Uh, now, we're now going to go to questions from Patreon officially. Uh, I call it Ask Zach. If you want to write in with questions on Patreon, you go to patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler. I apologize. It's the third time I've mentioned that, but I got to pimp it out. I got to get people over there. Uh, a lot of you, pe- a lot of you people support me over there. It's actually really awesome. I, I, I appreciate it. Um, for just a dollar a month, you get access to write into strong opinion sports. You also get to write into my other podcast, Zach Schaumler talking. You also get Zach Schaumler talking, my other podcast early on Patreon. It's all for a dollar a month. Uh, you can donate more if you want to, please do. It literally does help me pay my bills. So thank you. Um, now, Leon says on Patreon, Leon says, Hey, Zach, do you keep up with the Madden ratings near the release of the next game? Do ratings of players match what you think of them? Um, so I looked at the Madden ratings this year. I got a couple notes I want to share. Um, I, I thought it was interesting that Tom Brady is the, the highest rated quarterback in the game. That's surprising and kind of weird to me. Like, okay, whatever. I, I, I love Tom Brady. I'm a huge Tom Brady fan. The best quarterback in the game, Tom Brady, 97 overall. More than Aaron Rodgers, more than Mahomes, more than Josh Allen, more than Joe Burrow. Okay. Okay. Um, Here are my notes. So here's what I have to say about the Madden ratings. Christian McCaffrey's 96 overall, and Alvin Kamara's only 90. That feels like absolute ridiculousness to me. Uh, I would way rather have Alvin Kamara than Christian McCaffrey right now. McCaffrey is massively overrated, in my opinion, in this year's Madden. Um... 88 overall for Ezekiel Elliott is way too high. That's Ezekiel Elliott, 88 overall. I just, I can't believe that. That shocked me. Um, Jamal Adams is 90 overall. Uh, I'd love to see a breakdown of his numbers because 90 overall feels really high for Jamal Adams as a safety, but I mean, maybe like his coverage is really low, but his tackling is really highly rated. Like he's basically a linebacker that plays safety. So I'd be curious to see how that broke down, you know, broke down and how they awarded his numbers and his stats for Madden. Uh, It's kind of weird that the highest-rated linebacker in Madden is Fred Warner, 
uh, at only 94 overall. Like, do they hate linebackers? Why is there not a single linebacker over 94 overall in Madden? That's very weird to me. Um, it's weird that TJ Watt is rated below Miles Garrett. That's also a bit weird. Uh, Dak Prescott is the sixth best quarterback in the game. That feels really high, actually. Like they, you know, Madden unofficially tells us who they think are the top 10 quarterbacks in the NFL. They've got Dak Prescott at number six. I'm like, what? Well, let's go. Let me, I've got the list in front of me. What is it? So they've got Dak Prescott ahead of Justin Herbert, Russell Wilson, Lamar Jackson, and Matthew Stafford. I, I just don't see that at all. I just don't know how Dak Prescott is number six. Uh, in the ratings. I just can't believe, I can't believe that actually. I, Herbert only 88 feels low. Herbert should be like a 93. Jill Burrow, I'd put it 95. Josh Allen, 97. Mahomes and Rodgers are 99s in my opinion. Brady's more like a, a 92. Uh, I, 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 I greatly disagree with the quarterback ratings more than anything uh, in Madden this year. I'm like, wow. They, they basically told us our top 10 quarterbacks. And I'm like, well, I don't agree with that even a little bit. Uh, that's not even close. So uh, that's bizarre to me. I love Tom Brady. He's not the best quarterback in the NFL. Come on. Come on. Probably it's probably it's Josh Allen. It's Josh Allen, then Patrick Mahomes, and then, man, I, I don't even know. I, I don't know after that. Rodgers, then Burrow, then Herbert, then Wilson, then Brady probably, right? So I don't know. Um, it is also interesting. Tampa Bay's got uh, two linemen in the top 10 best linemen in Madden. That's Tristan Wirfs and Ryan Jensen. So does Dallas. By the way, Dallas is Zach Martin and Tyron Smith. Uh, you know, so on paper, Dallas and Tampa got some really good offensive linemen. That's awesome. But those are my thoughts on the Madden ratings this year. Zach wrote in on Patreon. Zach said, Hey Zach, what do you think of divas in sports? I've always thought that they didn't have a place, but understood that they will always be here. What do I think about divas in sports? Um, Look, I don't like divas at all, but a more talented player, you know, let me back up. The more talented a player is, the more nonsense a team is willing to put up with, right? So um, there's a YouTube video called, I look up crazy hot scale on YouTube and you'll find it. It's the exact same idea. Like the better a player is, the more they can get away with off the field. Um, and some players are no longer in the NFL because they weren't good enough to offset the circus they brought with them off the field. Um, there's a lot of names you might think of when I say that. Maybe the best example of that right now is Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown is a guy that, great football player, man. Like I, he was so good and he just couldn't, he just had like a mental breakdown and couldn't handle it and couldn't handle the, whatever was going on. And um, I saw a video of Antonio Brown the other day on a stage at some concert performing and it was, it was bad. It was weird. It was uncomfortable. I just was like, Oh man, how far that guy has fallen. And, but he's a shining example of once your level of, you know, diva or level of crazy exceeds the value you're bringing to the football team that people don't want to mess with you anymore. And so, um, that, that's my thought on divas in the NFL. Carson wrote on Patreon and said, Hey Zach, so just want to kind of put my money where my mouth is. I put $10 on Keaton Slovis to win the Heisman Trophy. 40 to 1, so we'll see if I'm 400 bucks richer at the end of the year. That's interesting to me. I've I never gambled. It makes me understand gambling a little bit more. Like losing $10 isn't that bad for the high reward of potentially getting $400. Now, I don't like screwing with money. I don't gamble at all. And you probably just threw away $10, honestly, which to me, that's a bad loss. I'm I'm very shrewd and don't I don't mess with money. Uh, and I don't take any gambling sponsorships, but I, I reserve the right to change my mind as I get older. But I, I just know that myself, I've got kind of an addictive personality. Like I, my immediate thought was, well, why not put a hundred dollars down then? Right. Because then you make 4,000. I mean, so I, I would just be, I just know that I, I don't trust myself to gamble. I just, I would probably lose too much money and be stupid and aggressive and think I'm right. And I, so I just don't even go there at all. I don't allow myself in that world. I don't take sponsorships from that world. I just stay away from gambling completely. Uh, and uh, I don't know. But you know, I, I got a text from my buddy yesterday. I was like, hey, I was talking to someone at FanDuel the other day about you. And um, they said, you know, they you know, they were frustrated by you a little bit because you don't take any gambling sponsorships. And I was like, yep, I, I don't. And uh, 
I, I just don't feel comfortable with that. I've turned down a lot of money in my career. Uh, and my, my dad is like, dude, take the money, be a mercenary. And I just, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to promote something that I think would be bad for me. So if I, if I don't use it myself, I'm not promoting that on my show. So I stay away from gambling and it's pretty weird because they're the biggest sponsor in the sports world, right? Like everybody has a gambling sponsorship on their show. Uh, and I, I, I can sleep at night. I try to stay away from it. I think it's bad for me. If it's bad for me, I'm not promoting it to anyone else ever. So, um, I hope people respect that and, uh, don't think I'm weird. I mean, I am weird, but whatever. Okay. Let's end the show with this today. Sorry, I forgot to put a warning in. So I'm going to go back and make an, make a cut here. Uh, I'm going to talk about formula one now for the rest of the show. If you don't like formula one and you you've had a good time, Hey, I appreciate it. Have a great day. If you're here for formula one, we're going to talk for about five minutes about the French grand prix and then end the show. So if you're gone, I love you. Thank you. If you like Formula One, stick around. We'll have a good time. Now, let's dive in. Uh, we just had the French Grand Prix. Max Verstappen won. It was a double podium for Mercedes. Lewis Hamilton got second. George Russell got third. Uh, here are the rest of the points finishers. Sergio Perez got fourth. Carlos Sainz got fifth. Fernando Alonso got sixth. In seventh, you had Lando Norris for McLaren. In eighth, you had Esteban Ocon for uh, Alpine. Ninth was Daniel Ricardo, and 10th was Lance Stroll. And uh, so that's all fine and dandy, but the story of the day to me was that it was another Ferrari failure. It's getting insane. On lap 18, Charles Leclerc was in first place uh, on track to probably win the race when he spun around and crashed into the wall. And Charles Leclerc took full responsibility. I actually really respected that. But it's still another painful loss for Ferrari. It's another time where they got in their own way and cost them greatly. It's the third time this year that Charles Leclerc has been in first and either crashed or retired. Uh, it happened in Spain. It happened in Azerbaijan and now in France. And on top of that, Ferrari then afterwards was openly mismanaging their number two driver, Carlos Sainz. They gave him an unsafe relief release from pit lane. He almost ran into Alex Albin's car. You know, Alex Albin's Williams is coming down the pit lane and they released Carlos Sainz right in front of him. It was terrible lack of detail. And uh, they were lucky that Ferrari, you know, they're lucky that Carlos Sainz only got a five second penalty for that. It could have been way worse than that. Um, later, they gave Carlos Sainz the wrong information. Uh, then as he was passing Sergio Perez for third, they are literally interrupting the guy on the radio as he's making his move, telling him to, to pit and you're like what that what's going on here like how are you not aware of what's happening with your driver and then when Carlos Sainz finally does pass Sergio Perez and gets into third with only 10 laps to go they randomly told him to pit and they made that decision way too late I don't know what they were thinking how they benefited there um it felt like Ferrari threw away third place frankly um and they might not have been able to finish uh, I, I, look, here's the thing. They, they had a five second penalty. So they would have had to either finish the race and then lose five seconds and deal with the consequences. Um, but I think it's very possible that, you know, they finished the race. And because George Russell and Sergio Perez were behind Carlos Sainz at that point, they would have been battling for fourth. That battle would have slowed them down a lot. It's very possible Carlos Sainz could have finished five seconds ahead of both of them. Um, they've got the information. I don't. But it felt like they just threw away a third place finish. And I, I thought Carlos Sainz could have pulled away from both of them. And it was just very weird all around. And I, I, it makes me think like something's got to be wrong at Ferrari right now. They are terrible at the small details. And I believe it's a leadership problem. It falls on Mattia Bonotto, uh, the team principal. Either the culture is toxic there and everyone is tense out of fear and afraid to screw up or genuinely maybe Ferrari just doesn't know how to handle the small details because when Charles Leclerc crashed, it felt like the whole team tensed up, which to me is more likely it's a toxic culture where everyone's feeling the pressure because right after Charles Leclerc crashed, suddenly they gave Carlos Sainz an unsafe release. There was poor communication. They couldn't make a decision I think the pressure is getting to them, to the team, to everyone. And you can't just say, you know, 
we're Ferrari. We don't make these kinds of mistakes. It's like, well, you are. You're, you're, you've had engine problems. You've had all kinds of lack of details. And I just lose respect for Ferrari more and more with every race. And I, it's just, it's baffling to me that Ferrari cannot avoid to keep shooting themselves. They can't stop shooting themselves in the foot. I don't know what's going on with them, but um, it's shameful. It's bad. They have a car that's worthy of being first in Formula One and looks like that, you know, their hopes of winning any kind of world title this year are just being thrown away with every race. We got 10 races left and I've got no confidence they can make up the gap to Red Bull and Max Verstappen at this point. Anything can happen. There's still a lot of races left, but I just, I am losing all confidence Ferrari more than I'm, um, it's not like they don't have time. It's that I don't think that even if they have the time, they can do what needs to be done to make up the points and uh oh man now uh it's cool to see george russell get p3 i like him he was way better better prepared for the race restart after a virtual safety car and got past sergio perez that was awesome good for george russell and a side story i enjoyed is alpine beat mclaren alpine got sixth and eighth while mclaren got seventh and ninth and alpine is now four points ahead of mclaren in the standings and uh after France, here are the team or constructor standings in Formula 1. Red Bull is in first with 396 points. In second behind them is Ferrari with 314 points. In third is Mercedes with 270 points. In fourth is Alpine with 93 points. And fifth behind them is McLaren with 89 points. And in the driver's standings right now, Max Verstappen leads Formula 1 with 233 points. Charles Leclerc is in second with 170 points. Sergio Perez is in third with 163 points. In fourth, you have Carlos Sainz with 144 points. Right behind him is George Russell with 143 points. And then Lewis Hamilton is in sixth with 127 points. Um, it was cool to see Lewis Hamilton in his 300th ever Grand Prix get second place. That was pretty cool. Uh, I'd love to see Mercedes pass Ferrari and get second in Formula 1. I'm, kind of rooting, I'm rooting for that right now at this point in the season. I... I'm really disappointed in Ferrari. I like the comeback Mercedes is making. And it's looking really, really likely that Max Verstappen and Red Bull will repeat as world champions. There's 10 races left. The next race is July 31st in Hungary. And uh, right now, man, if, if you're a Ferrari fan, I would imagine you are panicking and, and do not feel good about your team at all because they have not given you almost any reason to have confidence. And it's been a really, really wild and disappointing year so far for Ferrari, one that they are clearly massively underachieving and really, really missing out on the small, important details. All right, guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so very much for tuning in. I appreciate you. It's getting hot. It's uh, 9.30 already, and it's like 89 degrees. It's going to be a hot one today. I'm going to go back to the lake, upload the podcast, get on the boat, enjoy the lake, and uh, all right, I love you. I appreciate you. But um, bum, bam, we are done.